Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us. I know uh, the program is announced on very short notice, uh, but thank you for taking out the time from your busy schedules and joining us for this prelude. Uh, so in case any of you don't already know, this is a prelude for the international edition of the MRI teaching course, which will be happening on the last weekend of October and the first weekend of November. So for those of you who haven't already registered, please register. It is a five-day program. We have speakers from across the world, including the Mayo Clinic. We have speakers from Canada, England, all across the US, Australia, Singapore. And uh, we also have an entire day uh, organized by Dr. Dushan Sahani, who is uh, the chief of radiology at the University of Washington. And, uh, his entire, uh, his entire department will be uh, taking us through how they run their uh, MRI practices. So starting off today's preview session, we have uh, Dr. Alok Jaju. Uh, his topic for today is uh, congenital CNS anomalies. He's a pediatric neuro, uh, neuroradiologist at the Luri Children's Hospital of Chicago. If I can hand over to you, sir. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be speaking at this MRI conference today. Uh, my topic here is congenital CNS anomalies. As you know, it's a very broad topic. And in the next 30 to 35 minutes, I'll probably barely scratch the surface. So for this case-based review, what I have done is I have focused on a few selected entities. And I will start with showing an uncommon presentation of that entity and use that as a launch pad for a general discussion on that particular condition. So let's get started. So the first case is a 15-month-old who presented with seizures. On these sagittal T1-weighted images, we can right away see absence of the corpus callosum. And then there are these multiple sulci which radiate all the way up to the ventricular margins. On the coronal images, there is absence of crossing fibers, abnormal ram's horn orientation of the frontal horns, a high riding and dilated third ventricle. Similarly, on the uh, axial T2-weighted images, there is absence of uh, crossing fibers in the midline with a prominent interhemispheric fissure. But the patient also has many other abnormal Normalities, including these multiple cysts in the lateral ventricles and possibly in the interhemispheric fissure. Now you can also see those cystic structures on this sagittal T1-weighted image. Also, the, the cortex and the gyral contours are very abnormal with broad gyri and shallow sulci in the right frontal region associated with this large mass-like area of gray matter heterotopia. So what is this constellation of findings called? Is it a Cardi syndrome? Is it a Cardi Gutierrez syndrome? Is it glioneuronal tumor based on the cystic changes? Or is it Miller-Dyker syndrome? So this appearance is diagnostic of Accardi syndrome. So Accardi syndrome is one of the syndromes associated with corpus callosal dysgenesis, and it has um, the associated findings as we saw, including gray matter heterotopia, polymicrogyria, uh, cysts, and sometimes posterior fossa anomalies as well. It is a real developmental disorder, which is caused by an X-linked defect. So it is fatal in males and only manifests in females. Clinically, it is characterized by infantile spasms, and on fundoscopic exam, you may see chorioretinal lacunae. Uh, a few words about uh, corpus callosal dysgenesis. So corpus callosal dysgenesis is one of the most frequent plane malformation. Uh, it can be complete absence of corpus callosum, which is called agenesis or partial absence or dysgenesis. It is often associated with genetic abnormalities, either trisomies or some single gene mutations, or can be associated with extrinsic factors like maternal alcohol syndrome. Um, and uh, as you know, corpus callosal dysgenesis is often associated with other intracranial and spinal anomalies or craniofacial anomalies, and a lot of them have syndromic associations. This is a companion case. This is a 17-year-old male with developmental delay and seizures. On the axial T2 and T1-weighted images, we see this lobular hyperintense mass in the midline in the expected location of the corpus callosum. Also, there is parallel orientation of the lateral ventricles. On the sagittal T1-weighted images, we see this lobular T1 hyperintense mass in the region of corpus callosum, which completely suppresses on fat-saturated sequence. This is an enhancing vessel through that region. Uh, so the findings are suggestive of a pericolosal lipoma with uh, dysgenesis or absence of corpus callosum. Uh, 
So pericolosal lipoma, it's the most common uh, location for an intracranial lipoma. It occurs in the interhemispheric fissure and it is closely related to the corpus callosum, which is often malformed. There are two morphological subtypes of pericolosal lipoma, which include a tubular nodular, which is the more common, like in our case, and it's often associated with uh, severe corpus callosal dysgenesis. Uh, the other subtype is curvilinear, where we have where you have a thin band of fat along the corpus callosum, and the corpus callosum may be either normal or only mild it is genetic. Uh, there can be other associations with this, including absent septum pellucidum, as it is ACA, polymicrogyria, heterotopias, or sometimes dorsal cysts. Moving on to case number two. This is a one-month-old child with dysmorphic features. So on the, on the axial T1-weighted images, we see this abnormal fusion of the cerebral hemispheres across the midline. Um, the interhemispheric fissure is partly present. It's present anteriorly, and a small portion is present posteriorly, but it's obliterated in the midline. And you can see the continuation of gray matter and white matter across the midline, as well as this abnormal abnormally long sylvian fissure which continues across the midline over the vertex to extend onto the contralateral side. Uh, same findings on the coronal images, there is fusion uh, of the cerebral hemispheres in the midline, there is fusion of the ventricles with absent interventricular septum, um, and on the sagittal T1-weighted images we see absence of corpus callosum for the most part. So what's the diagnosis here? Is it schizencephaly? Is it scintillencephaly? Is it semilobar holoprosencephaly? Or is it arinencephaly? So this is an example of scintillencephaly, which also goes by the name of middle interhemispheric variant of holoprosencephaly. So what is holoprosencephaly? So holoprosencephalies are characterized by incomplete separation of hemispheres due to abnormal cleavage of the prosencephalon. It's often associated with other midline anomalies, including anomalies involving the corpus callosum and the hypothalamic pituitary axis, and also associated with craniofacial malformations. Holoprosencephaly is a spectrum with the least severe form being a low bar and the uh, with the most severe form being a low bar and the least severe being low bar. Middle interhemispheric variant is somewhere probably between semi low bar and, and low bar. So in illobar holoprosencephaly, there is a single midline forebrain with a horseshoe-shaped monoventricle and a dorsal cyst. In semi-lobar holoprosencephaly, there is some separation of the hemisphere. The interhemispheric fissure is partly present posteriorly, and there is fusion anteriorly. There is variable degree of deep nuclei and thalamic fusion uh, in semi-lobar. And lobar holoprosencephaly is the least severe form where the, there is only fusion of the most inferior portion of the frontal lobes, otherwise the hemispheres are separated. So this particular uh, case is the middle interhemispheric variant of holoprosencephaly, which is a relatively milder form, and there is cerebral fusion in the posterior frontal or the parietal region with partial presence of interhemispheric fissure anteriorly and posteriorly. There is a horizontally oriented sylvian fissure that extends across the midline over the vertex. The corpus callosum is usually abnormal with the body being absent and the genuine splenium are present. So holoprosencephaly are kind of the exception to the rule of colossal dysgenesis in terms of its embryological development. This is an example of semilobar holoprosencephaly where you see fusion of the frontal lobes across the midline. Uh, there is absence of interventricular septum, but, but the interhemispheric fissure is partly present posteriorly. Uh, again, you can see the same findings on T1-weighted images. There is this band of gray matter along the anterior aspect of the ventricles, absence of the uh, interventricular septum and fusion of the frontal lobes across the midline. On the sagittal images, we can see absence of the corpus callosum in the mid portion, although a portion of the splenium and probably probably the genu are present. This is an example of a lobar holoprosencephaly where there is lack of separation of the cerebral hemispheres. There is a single single forebrain with a horseshoe-shaped monoventricle which widely communicates with this large dorsal interhemispheric cyst. Uh, moving on to case number three, this is a child who presented with seizures. So on MR evaluation, we have um, coronal and sagittal T1 empirate sequence. So on the uh, on these T1 weighted images, we see this abnormal abnormally thickened and lobular appearing cortex in the in the right perisylvian region as well as in the left perisylvian region. Also on the sagittal images, we see this abnormally deep. Uh, sylvian fissure which extends all the way up to the vertex and is lined by these thickened and lobular appearing cortex. Same findings on T2-weighted images, you see abnormally thickened and lobular cortex in bilateral perisylvian region. Also, there is absence of, a, um, absence of septum pellucidum. 
So what's the diagnosis? Is it schizencephaly, polymicrogyria? Is it focal cortical dysplasia type 2 or is it gray matter heterotopia? So this is an example of bilateral perisylvian polymicrogyria. So polymicrogyria is characterized by numerous small gyri with bumpy appearance of the gray-white contour. It is caused by derangement of neuronal organization and abnormal cortical lamination. Uh, it can be sporadic or can be genetic or sometimes may be associated with in utero infection or vascular insults. There are multiple syndromic associations uh, with polymicrogyria and on imaging it can be focal, multifocal or diffuse. So bilateral perisylvian polymicrogyria is one of the common presentations. Uh, it can be sporadic or familial. It presents with developmental delay, uh, motor deficits, and sometimes seizures. There is an MR grading system for perisylvian polymicrogyria. So grade one is the most severe, where you have involvement of perisylvian region, as well as frontal or occipital lobes, and the abnormality reaches all the way up to the, up to the frontal or occipital poles. A uh, grade two uh, is where the polymicrogyria extends into the frontal or occipital lobe but does not reach the poles. Grade 3 is purely insular and opercular in region involvement like we saw in our case. And grade 4 is the least severe form where you have involvement only of the posterior insula bilaterally. So these are um, two cases we're showing focal polymicrogyria. So the patient on the left side has this almost mass-like lesion in the left frontal lobe with multiple lobular uh, areas of gray and white matter. So this is an example of a complex uh, nodular polymicrogyria, uh, which can mimic a mass, but, but it does follow gray matter signal on all the sequences. Uh, this is another example of focal polymicrogyria where in the left parietal lobe, we see an abnormally deep sulcus and a thickened lobular cortex lining the sulcus. So that can, again, this is something um, that can cause seizures and uh, needs a careful evaluation of MRI for diagnosis. This is an example of diffuse polymicrogyria. A young child, a few months old, uh, presented for um, presented with infantile spasms. Uh, so on the T1 and T2 weighted MRI, we see this abnormal um, gyral and sulcal pattern bilaterally. The gyri are abnormally abnormally wide, the sulci are shallow, and there is this nodular lumpy bumpy appearance of the gray white junction throughout. So this is an example of bilateral diffuse polymicrogyria. Moving on to case number four, uh, a three-year-old female presenting with seizures. So on the axial T2 and uh, T1 weighted images, again, we see this abnormal gyral and sulcal pattern. There is broadening of the gyri and very shallow sulci, and there is associated thickening of the uh, of the cortex. If you look more carefully in the posterior region, there is this band of white matter which separates somewhat normal appearing cortex with this additional um, band of gray matter uh, looking tissue. So, uh, the finding is probably seen a little better on T1-weighted images where we see posteriorly uh, a relatively normal thickness of the cortex, a band of white matter, and then another band of gray matter. Anteriorly, it looks more like diffuse cortical thickening. So what's the diagnosis? Is it polymicrogyria? Is it gray matter heterotopia? Is it focal cortical dysplasia type 2? Or is it agyria? So this is an example of subcortical band heterotopia. So subcortical band heterotopia belongs to the lesencephaly uh, spectrum of disorders. So lesencephalies are characterized by smooth brain. There is paucity of gyri and sulci and associated thick cortex. Uh, it's it, it's it. It's on a spectrum, so age area is the most severe form of lesencephaly where there is absence of a sulcation and the brain has a very smooth appearance with shallow sylvan fissures giving it an hourglass appearance. Um, or it, the milder forms can be, uh, is called the package area where there is decreased number of, of gyri which are abnormally broad and shallow sulci. And package area can be associated with subcortical band heterotopia. Uh, so lesencephaly is caused by arrested neuronal migration and the, the, the cortical lamination is abnormal with four layered cortex instead of five. Uh, there are two important genes uh, which are uh, which are involved in lesencephaly spectrum. The, the first one is the LIS1 gene. It's the most common. Either deletion of or mutation of this gene can result in uh, lesencephaly. The other is XLIS or the DCX gene. Uh, it is a X, X, it, it's a, it's a X-linked disorder which causes lesencephaly in homozygous males, but it causes subcortical band heterotopia in carrier females. So our case was a three-year-old female who had a, who had a, 
tachycharia with subcortical band heterotopia. This is an example of um, what's called the classic lesion cephaly, where you have a smooth brain with diffuse lithic cortex and very shallow sylvian fissure, giving it a figure of eight appearance. This is another example of lesion cephaly, but in this case, there is associated microphthalmia and retinal detachment. So this constellation of finding is called the Miller-Dyker syndrome, and this is associated with less one mutation. Another variant of lesencephaly, which is sometimes called lesencephaly type 2, is the cobblestone lesencephaly. Uh, again, just like any other lesencephaly, there is reduction in, in normal sul sulcation, but in addition, there is a bumpy appearing cortical surface, which, uh, which gives the name uh, cobblestone lesencephaly. This is commonly associated with the muscular dystrophy syndromes, which also go by the name of alpha dystroglyconopathies. And these include conditions like Walker Warburg, Fukuyama, and muscle eye brain disease. So on imaging, we may not be able to distinguish between these individual subtypes. So what we can call on imaging is a water, Walker Warburg imaging phenotype when we have all of these findings present. So let's look at an example. So in this patient, uh, we have this uh, diffuse paucity of salsa in both cerebral hemispheres with a smooth appearing cortex, uh, with, with a smooth appearing gyri, but there is this lobular uh, morphology the, to the cortex. So that's ca characteristic of uh, cobblestone lesion cephaly. You can see it a little better in the parieto-occipital regions. Uh, there is associated marked ventriculomegaly, and this characteristic kinked appearance of the brainstem with associated cerebellar hypoplasia. Uh, there may be some mild cystic changes in the cerebellum as well. This patient also has uh, abnormalities of the eye in the form of persistent hyperplastic primary vitria. So this constellation of findings of cobblestone lesencephaly, colossal dysgenesis, ventriculomegaly, abnormal, abnormally kinked brainstem, hyperplastic cerebellum, and ocular anomalies is associated with the walker Warper phenotype. Next case is a five-month-old who presented with nasal obstruction. So we have a sagittal T2 and T1 weighted image, uh, which shows a bilobed mass extending into the nasal cavity. Superiorly, the mass appears to communicate with the subarachnoid space via a defect in the cribriform plate. Uh, same findings on the axial and coronal images. And on the post-contrast images, there is enhancement of mucosa surrounding this uh, cystic mass, but there is no enhancement within the mass itself. Uh, so Pretty straightforward diagnosis. Is it a cephalocele, a nasal dermoid, nasal glioma, or an inverted papilloma? So the diagnosis in this case is a cephalocele. Uh, so cephalocele is congenital herniation of one or more intracranial structures through a defect in the skull. Uh, and, and depending on the contents, it could be a meningocele, which contains meninges and CSF, meningoencephalocele, or simply encephalocele, which contains meninges, CSF, and brain parenchyma. Um, cephalocele is a more general term, which in includes both meningoceles and meningoencephalocele. And then there is a variation of cephalocele, which is called as atretic parietal cephalocele, which is typically seen in the midline hyparietal region and is characterized by herniation of men meninges and some fibrous or dysplastic tissue. Um, location, it can occur in the posterior location, either in the occipital or occipital cervical region. And this form of occipital cephalocele is more common in the, in the, in the Western countries. Or it could be frontoethmoidal, which is called the sensipital uh, cephalocele, which is more, more common in Southeast Asia. So frontoethmoid uh, cephalocele can also be classified into two types based on uh, the bony defect. It could be nasofrontal, as in this case, where you have herniation between the frontal bone and the nasal bone, or it could be nasoethmoidal, where you have herniation between nasal bone and the nasal cartilage, like in our case. This is an example of occipital cephalo cephalocele. So we have a large bilobed cystic mass uh, uh, arising from this defect in the occipital bone. There may be some herniation of brain parenchyma through the defect. Um, intracranially, we see effacement of the extraaxial spaces, mild dilatation of the ventricles, and abnormal morphology of the posterior fossa structures, including a small posterior fossa effacement of the cisterna magna, uh, inferior herniation of the cerebellum, and crowding at the foramen magnum. So these findings are reminiscent of a Chiari 2 malformation, but when you have a cephalocele with findings similar to Chiari 2, it's called Chiari 3 malformation. Um, uh, so typically in Chiari 3 malformation, the cephalocelles are a little lower. Uh, they are in the inferior occipital or the occipital cervical region, but in our case, it was uh, more in the superior occipital region. 
this is an example of a broad based parietal cephalocele where there is a large bony defect in the parietal bone and herniation of both uh, both the cerebral hemispheres through the defect there is also some gliosis uh, in the herniated brain parenchyma and this is an example of atretic parietal cephalocele. Like we previously said, it's most commonly seen in the midline parietal bone and it's characterized by a herniation of meninges and some dysplastic tissue, but there is no herniation of brain parenchyma or dural sinuses. Uh, there is abnormal, there's typically abnormal orientation of the straight sinus, which is more vertical. There is a persistent falcine sinus. And then there is this cigar shaped CSF cleft, which extends from the supracerebellar system all the way up to the defect in the calvary. Um, and also in this case on the MR venogram images, we see this focal defect in the superior or focal splitting of the superior sagittal sinus, which is related to where the tract bisects it to reach the defect in the calvarium. The next case is a spine case. This is a one month old child who presented with a sacral subcutaneous mass. On the sagittal and axial T2 weighted images, we see this, uh, we see dysraphism of the sacral region and we see the cystic mass, uh, which appears to be contiguous with the distal spinal cord. Here again, you can see the distal spinal cord with the cystic mass contiguous with it. Um, there is no associated lipoma, although there is some continuity of the epidural fat with the, uh, with the subcutaneous fat. The important thing to note here is this is a closed defect that the, the cystic structure is, is completely covered by skin and the subcutaneous tissues. So what's the diagnosis here? Is it a myelomeningocele? Is it a myeloschesis? Is it a myelocystocele or is it a dermoid cyst? So the correct answer here is myelocystocele. So myelocystocele is, is a closed neural tube defect where you have herniation of the dilated central canal or the seringocele through a defect in the posterior elements. Uh, here is a here is a diagram illustrating the myelocystocele. So you have dilatation of the distal um, dilatation of the of the spinal canal, uh, which is called which is called a seringocele, and the seringocele extends through a dysraphic defect in the posterior elements. And and since it's a closed neural tube defect, the cyst is covered by skin and subcutaneous fat. So it's a rare form of closed or occult spinal dysraphism presence with skin covered subcutaneous mass, as in our case. It's most commonly seen in the sacral region where it's called the terminal myelocystocele, although it can be seen in the cervicothoracic region where it's called the non-terminal myelocystocele. This is an example of non-terminal myelocystocele where we have this dilated central canal extending into this fluid filled tract uh, through a dysraphic defect in the upper cervical spine. So this is the meningocele component. So this is like a cyst within a cyst and the outer cyst is the meningocele um, and the inner cystic component which is contiguous with the spinal cord is the, is the myelocystocele component. So I find this chart very useful, which uh, classifies the neural tube defects. Um, and uh, neural tube defects can involve the cranium as well as the spine, but we are focusing on spine right now. So spinal defects can be open or closed. Open defects are associated with Chiari malformation and ventricular megaly, while closed defects are not usually associated with uh, intracranial findings. Uh, the two uh, the two open neural tube defects which you need to remember is the myelomeningocele, which is by far the most common, or mylos, uh, and the second is myeloschesis or mylocele. Uh, the most important closed neural tube defect which will present with the skin covered subcutaneous mass is lipomyelomeningocele, and then you have the less common myelocystocele, like we saw in this case. So whenever you are evaluating someone with a neural tube defect, the first step is to to identify whether it's a closed or open defect, and that will completely change your differential diagnosis. This is an example of lipomyelomeningocele where you don't have a cystic structure, but you have a lipoma which is contiguous between the uh, between the, uh, you have a lipoma along the distal spinal cord and it's contiguous with the subcutaneous fat. And again, this is a skin cover defect. Uh, so this is an example of a fetal MRI with myelomeningocele. So, so these are fetal, this fetal MRI was obtained at 22 week of gestation and this was obtained at 25 week gestation after, after in utero repair of the myelomeningocele. So on the initial MR, we see this large dysraphic defect in the lumbosacral region with a large cystic structure compatible with the myelomeningocele. Intracranially, we see findings of KRE2 malformation, including effacement of supra and infratentorial CSF spaces, small and crowded posterior fossa, as well 
uterus ventricular megaly. Uh, in utero repair was done sometime around 25 weeks and a follow-up scan four weeks later showed marked improvement in the intracranial findings. Here we can see that the defect has been patched off. And intracranially, there is restoration of the supran and fratentorial extraaxial space and a marked improvement in the posterior fossa structures. Um, we can again see the cisterna magna and the basal cisterns, as well as the fourth ventricle appears normal in size. There may be some, some dysplastic cerebellar tissue, but no, no herniation or crowding at the foramen magna. So myelomeningocele is open spinal dysraphism. It's characterized by a low-lying spinal cord, which ends in a neural placard, and the neural placard extends beyond the level of the skin surface, which causes expansion of the associated subarachnoid spaces. Intracranially, it's associated with KRE2 malformation and ventricular megaly, like, like we saw in this case. Um, in the recent year, our institution um, has uh done a lot of in utero repairs of myelomeringocele and their the and the data on that has been very encouraging so so the initial trial which established the efficacy of in utero myelomeringocele repair was done in 2011 the mom's trial and um it, it showed that in utero repair um, either reversed or corrected hindbrain herniation, and it reduced the need for VP shunt as well as improved the motor outcomes on follow-up exams. The trial was so successful that it has to be st stopped midway uh, so that the treatment can be offered to all the patients. Uh, currently, uh, in utero repair can be done either by open approach or a fetoscopic approach, uh, and the repair would be just like a postnatal repair, and it involves dissection of the neural placard with primary closure of the dura and the skin. Uh, there is a grading system for KRE2 malformation, which we use uh, to follow up these patients with in utero repair. So grade one is normal posterior fossa. So you can see the cisterna magna, normal size fourth ventricle, and no effacement of the basal cisterns. Grade two is where there is effacement of the fourth ventricle, but the cisterna magna is still preserved. And grade three is the most severe, where there is effacement of the fourth ventricle, as well as effacement of the cisterna magna and crowding at the foramen magnum. So in our case, the patient initially had a grade three uh, grade 3 KRE2, which uh, improved to grade 1 on the follow-up exam. So in summary, brain malformations, I didn't even attempt to classify them because it's very difficult. One of the reasons it's difficult is because a lot of brain structures develop at the same time. So any insult affects multiple different pathways. So the, so the anomalies are associated with each other and it can vary greatly from patient to patient and even in identical twins with the same genetic defect, uh, the malformations may look very different. Uh, broadly, you can classify uh, anomalies of brain into anomalies of dorsal prosencephalon development, which will include anomalies of cerebral commissures, like we saw abnormal development of the corpus callosum or malformations of cortical development. Or you will have anomalies of posterior prosencephalon development, which will include things like holoprosencephaly and some midline anomalies. You can have anomalies of midbrain or hindbrain development, which would include uh, Dandy Walker syndrome and cerebellar and brainstem hypoplasia syndromes. Or you could have anomalies of the mesenchyme, which uh, would be one example would be a cephalocele. Spine malformations again can be classified based on embryology. So anomalies of nerulation are the most common uh, with non-disjunctions leading to dysraphism. You could have anomalies of caudal cell mass, which includes tight phylum and caudal regression syndrome, or you could have anomalies of the notochord itself, such as split cord malformations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you for such a wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, uh, Dr. Alok Jaju will also be joining us in the main conference. I think his lecture is on the 29th of October. That is the second day of our conference. So please tune in. I have put the program and uh, uh, the registration link in the chat box. So please do register. Uh, our next lecture will be taken by Dr. Manjir Dike. Uh, she is a pediatric and uh, fetal uh, radiologist at uh, the University of Washington. Her uh, topic for today is fetal MRI. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Manjari Dike. I'm a professor at the University of Washington. And I uh, would like to talk about uh, fetal MRI Improving the diagnosis for accurate prenatal counseling. First off, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this lecture. Um, 
So we move on. So fetal MRI was described in 1983. Um, used, we used low field strength magnets, but now with the advances that have happened in the hardware and software, it's become pretty fast to acquire the images. So we acquire in milliseconds and we effectively freezing fetal movement. So this just shows a number of exams that were done. And even for until 2000, you can see that the number of MRIs has been progressively increasing um, uh, over the years. And it's gone much more uh, recently as well. So we need to remember that MR is an adjunct to ultrasound. Ultrasound is the primary screening modality. But we know there are quite a lot of limitations with ultrasound as well. Some of these are like rever reverberation artifact, core penetration uh, from an ossified skull, when the fetus is, when the uh, mother has oligohydramnios, it becomes very difficult to see fetal structures because of lack of fluid. In fetal, if the fetal position is such that you cannot see some of the structures, particularly in late pregnancy, and then some of the uh, abnormalities, especially uh, intracranial CNS abnormalities, have non specific appearance on ultrasound. So, what are the advantages of fetal MR? Um, you have superior contrast resolution. You can see the cranial structures much better because you don't have the same limitations as ultrasound. You also get a big field of view, and you can do multiplanar imaging. And of course, the fact that it has uh, it uses non-ionizing radiation is very helpful as well. So, why do we call it as an adjunct to ultrasound? Because we use it a lot of times to confirm the diagnosis or have an alternative diagnosis. Um, we found some additional abnormalities with fetal MRI as well. And then it's very helpful in patient counseling and pregnancy management, so especially when the providers, when the pedi pediatricians look at these images. It's easier for them to understand MR than to understand ultrasound. And in some cases, it's a problem solver as well. So, um, Stan Torset, these, these guys in 2010, uh, you evaluated you know, the combined use of ultrasound and MR for M uh, detecting anomalies. And they found that mostly, uh, abnormalities of the central nervous system in about 38% of um, times and lung and thoracic abnormalities where we did fetal MRs. And in 42%, the referral diagnosis was concordant with the post-referral diagnosis after an MR was done. But in 29%, the post-referral diagnosis changed completely. And they found additional findings in almost 28% of the cases. So you take the 29% and 28% together, that's a pretty big number. So this is a case in point. This fetus came to us pretty late, approximately 32 weeks of gestation. And what they had was just mild um, hydrocephalus, ventricular megaly. Uh, and it was really mild, but it was very difficult to see the intracranial structures because the skull is quite ossified. So we decided to do an MRI in this patient. And when we did the MR, not only did we find the absence of corpus callosum, but you can see that there's a small segment here with this communication between the ventricular system and um, arachnoid space. And this was a small area of schizencephaly that we found on the MR as well. Another case in point where you have cross-section through the um, uh, chest in this fetus. This fetus was actually referred to us for pericardial effusion, uh, an abnormal axis of the uh, heart. So we saw this, we saw the pericardial effusion, but in addition to that, we saw that, you know, this doesn't look right. There is an abnormal cardiac axis, but there must be something that is either pushing it or there's you know, hypoplasia of the lung on this side. So we decided to do an MRI. And on the MR, what we found was this patient, this fetus had a right-sided diaphragmatic hernia. You can see the uh, heart is pushed off to the left, the lung is up in the chest, uh, some of the bowel loops as well up in the chest, and coronal images so, uh, uh, show you that um, abnormality quite well. So this was completely misdiagnosed as a pericardial effusion on the ultrasound, but actually it was much more than that. This was a, a diaphragmatic hernia. This is a postnatal radiograph of that baby, and that confirmed our findings with uh, that we had on the uh, uh, on the MRI. So there are some prerequisites for fetal MR. Um, usually we use a 1.5 Tesla magnet, but in some centers it started using Tesla as well. Uh, we use a surface story coil, and we try to do the MR after 18 weeks, both because of the uh, uh, possibility of the magnetic fields interfering with the organogenesis, but also more importantly, because before 18 weeks, structures are really small, and it's very difficult to see things on uh, MR. It is important that we get informed consent. 
Uh, we have to make sure there are no other contraindications for MR, you know, hardware, et cetera, et cetera. We always like to have a recent ultrasound. If the patient doesn't have an ultrasound, we try to get it on, done on the same day because reading the ultrasound, MRI with the ultrasound is very helpful. So bind position with the first, um, that way the patients are very comfortable. They can look up and out of the magnet if they feel claustrophobic. And we try in later gestation, you, know, you try to make the patient with the, the mom as comfortable as possible. So if they want to be in a left lateral ligament disposition to avoid compression of the IBC, we sometimes organize that as well. So we, uh, after doing a localizer with the T1 weighted sequence, um, we do use a T2 weighted sequence, um, a balanced FFE, a quick look uh, at the, you know, as a localizer to see where the fetus is. And based on that, then we plan our um, single shot images. And we try to make it so that they are an orthogonal plane to the fetus. And this is important concept for the technologist to understand that the orthogonal plane in the fetus may be oblique in the mother as a fetus may be in an oblique position. So it has to be orthogonal to the fetus and not to the mother. Um, so we, after getting the three orthogonal planes in T2-weighted sequences, we get a T1-weighted sequence um, as a quick look for any kind of hemorrhage um, or other bright uh, structures, fat, et cetera. Um, we sometimes get diffusion-weighted images. As a protocol, we get diffusion-weighted images for our, um, our brain anomalies. Uh, some of these other sequences are optional. It depends on the time. It depends on how easy is it to get. You know, if the fetus is moving around, it's very difficult to get all the other sequences. Um, we don't give any contrast because it's considered as a, considered as a category C drug and can has been shown to um, cause development delay in rats and rabbits. So once the single shot sequences are done, they take about 18 to 20 seconds. We do some balanced FFP sequences as well. Again, they take about 8 to 10 seconds. And the thing that we are worried about is um, motion, obviously, and the two types of motion, the uh, maternal breathing motion. So we need to make sure that we get breath hold sequences and then uh, fetal motion, which can be bulk motion where the baby, baby is moving around, um, baby just you know, flipping, et cetera. Extremity motion where they're just moving their limbs. And then the fetus is swallowing and breathing as well. And that can cause problem with um, imaging the fetus. Uh, as well. So what are the indications that we use it for? So we use it for all of these indications, most commonly for CNS and um, uh, chest abnormalities, mostly diaphragmatic hernia, but we've used it also for neck uh, masses, renal abnormalities, sacral oxygen teratomas, very helpful in conjoined twins, and then in some cases in twin twin transfusion as well. So for CNS um, use, fetal MRI is very helpful. Um, particularly for etiology of ventricular megaly or posterior fossa abnormalities, and then evaluation of myelination and migration along abnormalities as well. So Deborah Levine um, from Brigham, she uh, looked at this uh, fetal MRI and found that in about 40% um, of those cases, MRI led to a change in diagnosis. Um, Twickler also looked at, you know, um, fetal MRI cases specifically for CNS and found that we could see additional information in 64% and change in diagnosis in 28%. But also they could, there was an alteration in the timing or mode of delivery in about 11% of cases. It is important to remember that the fetal brain um, undergoes development as we go through the gestation ages. So you have increasing sulcation and gyration as you go into the later gestational ages. Uh, and it's important to understand uh, and keep in mind what the brain pattern looks like at these different gestational ages. So these are some cases that I'd like to share. This is a patient who came in with severe hydrocephalus, as you can see in the uh, ultrasound images. We did an MR on this patient and found that there was definitely severe hydrocephalus blown out ventricle on one side, um, uh, uh, but the posterior fossa was normal and the uh, 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 third ventricle looked uh, small in size. So this was a patient with aqueductal stenosis. This is a patient again was presented for uh, uh, hydrocephalus, uh, posterior fossa looked normal, uh, and then MRI showed confirmed the hydrocephalus uh, and showed that this was again a case of aqueductal stenosis. This is a uh, uh, these are two patients. Um, uh, they both presented for uh, uh, increased cisterna magna, and you can see that. You know, the brain on MRI seems normal, 
except for, and the posterior fossa looked normal as well, except for increase in the size of the cisterna magna. So this was, these were cases of megacisterna magna. Conversely, when you have uh, cerebellar abnormalities and wormian abnormalities, you're looking at daddy walker malformation as can be seen in this patient, where there's complete absence of the vermis and one of the cerebral, uh, um, cere cerebellar hemisphere occurs small in size as well. Uh, Inferior worm and hyperplasia would be similar, except the wormis would be small in size. You can actually see the wormis over here. There are measurements that are available that people can do to um, confirm the size of the uh, wormis on sagittal images. Um, and, and also uh, MRI can help in looking for other abnormalities in these fetuses. So the patient who had a um, encephalocele that was seen on uh, ultrasound, and the uh, question was, was there anything inside this particular encephalocele? And you can see that there's no brain parenchyma within this encephalocele, though the inter inter the parenchyma within the uh, skull within in, was, was dysplastic and disorganized, um, but there was nothing protruding outside. This is a patient who had uh, colposephaly, as can be seen on the uh, ultrasound. Um, but the posterior fossa looked abnormal as well, and there was this communication between the fourth ventricle and the cisterna magna. So on MR, um, we could confirm the findings that there was uh, absence of human septum pellicidin. Um, as can be seen in these images, here's on a coronal, it definitely shows the absence. And then um, the posterior fossa looks abnormal, it's enlarged. Uh, there's absence of the um, Worm is a uh, smaller size of the worm is, so this was inferior worm in hypoplasia. But in addition, this baby also had an arachnoid cyst located in the midline as well. This was a patient who came in with hydrocephalus in later pregnancy. Uh, the first trimester ultrasound, second trimester ultrasound was normal. Um, and it seemed as if the posterior fossa looked quite full, had some echogenic areas within it. So we did an MR in this patient, and yes, there was hydrocephalus, but the hydrocephalus was because there was a large tumor in the posterior fossa that was obstructing the outflow. And uh, you can see that there was some herniation of this tumor into the upper uh, uh, spinal canal as well. This baby, um, we diagnosed it as a posterior fossa teratoma. This baby um, went on, uh, was born, and um, you can see that the MR confirmed the posterior fossa mass. There were some areas of hemorrhage within this particular mass. Diffusion uh, shows restriction. Unfortunately, this baby passed away. And uh, on pathology, we could see the pathology here. There was a large mass that was invading into the cerebellum and into the midbrain. And this was, uh, this was a medulloblastoma that this baby had. This is a case in point where at 28 weeks, this patient came in with hydrocephalus. We could see that there was heterogeneity in the uh, corpus, in the um, choroid plexus, uh, and, and the ventricular walls looked echogenic, and there was ventricular megaly. So um, we did suspect that either this is a mass or there's hemorrhage within this um, uh, ventricle. So we got an MR, uh, MR done. MR um, showed the uh, ventricular megaly, the heterogeneity that we saw. And then on even weighted images, you could see the blood within the ventricle. So this uh, confirmed our findings that this was all blood located within the ventricle. On further investigation, it was found out that this was non uh, alloimmune thrombocytopenia causing intracranial hemorrhage and um, ventricular megaly in this particular baby. These are some postnatal images in the same fetus, and you can see similar findings as we saw on the prenatal ultrasound and prenatal uh, MRI uh, as well. So in terms of spine, um, Griffiths found that there was 80% of cases had concordance with ultrasound, but 20% of cases had change in management. This is a case in point where there is a cystic mass at the uh, 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 sacral end, and this uh, uh, you know, in these cases, what we're looking for, is there any intra-abdominal ex uh, extension of this uh, cystic, hyper uh, cystic lesion? This was a cystic sacrococcygeal teratoma. There was some amount of extension intra-abdominally, so it was a mixed intra and extra-abdominal uh, 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 sacrococcygeal teratoma in this particular baby. This was a patient who had an echogenic mass in the spine. There was some vascularity to this echogenic mass. We did an MRI, you could localize the, the, the mass, it did contain fat within it. And so we thought this was a spinal lipoma. This baby actually did uh, get postnatal MR done and you could see the extent of this lesion. This was a spinal lipoma that was confirmed. And um, this was seen on the uh, prenatal M M ultrasound and MR quite well. Now face and neck anomalies is an important um, 
uh, important indication. We think that because what we do in these patients is sometimes you have to do exit procedure, which is the ex utero intrapartum therapy, where the baby is delivered but left on placental circulation. And then yeah, once the airway is established, then the placental connection is uh, severed. So we think that these uh, MRI definitely helps in sort of planning out um, delivery in the, or method of delivery in these patients. Um, you can see the swallowing in these babies. You can see the normal location of the tongue, and it, it is very well defined on uh, MRI. It's not well defined on ultrasound because of the shadowing from surrounding bones. So this is a patient who had uh, polyhydramnios. So the baby wasn't swallowing, and there seemed to be fullness in the inferior um, in the in the uh, um, uh, area inferior to the chin and the anterior neck. Uh, but it was difficult to define one because of, because of the fluid and because of the shadowing from surrounding structures. But when we did an MR, you can easily see that there's a large mass located in, in this floor of the mouth, uh, which was obstructing the um, uh, swallowing, obstructing the um, airway and also the esophagus. And so that's why this baby wasn't swallowing. And this was a teratoma in the floor of the mouth. Another case in point where this baby had severe myofibrillary, as you can see in this polyhydramnios. Um, so we knew that this was a problem. This is severe myofibrillary. This baby will need some sort of support in terms of intubation. But the the, the real thing, the the real um, utility of MR was in finding out that in addition to the severe myofibrillary, there was a uh, retrognathy, and the tongue was located quite posterior, and it was obstructing the. Uh, uh, the oropharynx and the nasal pharynx. So intubation in this baby uh, through the nasal passages or oral passages would be quite difficult. And we could warn the pediatric surgeons that this needed a tracheostomy to be performed. Uh, so that's how we could help in uh, managing the patient uh, uh, and managing the delivery in this patient. We find this to be very helpful in teratomas to again localize the airway and see if the airway is obstructed. Look at the size of the mass and the extent of involvement. Um, in terms of non-CNS anomalies, um, as I said, diaphragmatic hernia is very important, um, but we've used it for lung hypoplasia and other chest masses as well. Lungs have different signal intensity at different gestational ages. 19 weeks compared to a 33 weeks, they get brighter and um, uh, 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 as compared to um, earlier gestations as well. There are papers that have looked at normal and hypoplastic fetal lungs and done volumetric assessment. This is a good paper from radiology that looks at observed versus predicted uh, volume. And they, they could find out that if it was 40% of below the um, expected, then the, most of the fetuses did not survive. Uh, the way they did this was they um, measured the volume uh, ROI around each lung and then added it up and then had a, had a formula for the predicted volume. And that's how they could ca calculate as to what was the difference. Uh, Kuwashima has looked at signal intensity and they found that the signal intensity ratio between the lung and the liver was less than two, which are these black circles. Um, they had, uh, you know, they had either neonatal um, um, death, pulmonary neonatal death in these patients or really uh, 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 severe uh, pulmonary hypoplasia. So in terms of diaphragmatic hernia, um, Ultrasound can help, and uh, in screening, you can see the stomach being up in the chest. Uh, but MR really shows you the extent of the defect and the structures that are located, in addition to locate, locating the uh, residual lung on the other side. This is another patient who has um, stomach that's located centrally, uh, but you can see the uh, lung and calculate the amount of lung that is res remaining, which can help in postnatal prediction of survival. We've uh, so in terms of gastroschisis or other abnormalities like orthalocytes, we don't think it is as helpful. Um, they, they may help in sort of if there is a question or if it's a multiple anomaly uh, fetus and this is an incident or, or this is a finding additional finding that is found. But we found in terms of about this particular case um, to be with MRI to be very helpful. This patient had a stomach that was located centrally, more central than what we would say is normal. And so we decided to do an MR. And what we found on MR was you could see the stomach, but on the T2 weighted images, all the small bowel loops are located on one side. And on the T1 weighted images, because the large bowel loops are bright because of meconium within them, 
they were all located on one side. So we gave a diagnosis of bowel, bowel malnutrition. Unfortunately, this baby did not survive because of other anomalies that this baby had. And pathology confirmed our diagnosis where you could see all the large, small bowel on one side and all the large bowel on one side. And this was a, a, a case of bowel malnutrition. Other chest masses like sequestration, again, looking at the extent and looking at the residual lung, um, it's helpful. But you can also find other anomalies. For example, in this patient, we found the sequestration. So you can see the sequestration here. But in addition, the stomach and the bowel loop seem to be up in the chest as well. And this was sequestration with a CDH. Um, as I said, it can be helpful in twins, especially to look at the membrane if it is very difficult to see it. But more importantly, in conjoined twins, because you're trying to figure out what are the things that are connected and what's you know, belonging where. So this is a conjoined twin. We can see the uh, uh, connection from the chest down to the pelvis. Uh, and we could figure out on the MRI as to what structures were uh, conjoined and shared and what structures were located individually. So we do MRI in all our conjoined twins. MR is very helpful in peaky tumors. This patient had a normal uh, second trimester ultrasound, came back in third trimester, had this big mass, very vascular. Uh, we did an MR to look at the extent, map out the uh, location in addition to the involvement of the structures. It was located mainly in the left lobe of the liver. And this patient uh, had a postnatal CP, which showed that this was a hematuroendothelioma. Other cases like arthrogryposis, MRI can help because ultrasound gives you a limited image of the um, findings. So I can see the, uh, the uh, head and the neck over here. I can see on 3D some of the structures, but because of its multiplanar capability, MR can give you an overall view in addition to looking at specific structures like intracranial abnormalities, if there are any. There are new advances that people have come out with, including uh, all of these. So 3D MR can be done with either T1 or T2 weighted images, and you can use it to look at these structures. Um, this is more of a research thing and not done as a, a routine. So this particular paper in applied radiology looked at bowel, and they could see um, uh, gastrointestinal duplication cysts causing narrowing of the bowel on, on the 3D images. Um, uh, cardiac MR has been uh, uh, done as a research mainly. Mainly they use uh, multiple untriggered T2 um, weighted uh, T2 haste images, and um, you can see a four chamber heart over here. Similarly, here's uh, a, a baby that you can see the aortic outflow and the ductal arch. So uh, again, done as a research and not done as routine, because I think ultrasound does really well in those cases. Diffusion weighted images can be acquired. They can be pretty quick. But, and very important for hypoxic ischemic lesions in the brain. Um, so we use it as a routine for our um, uh, uh, CNS anomalies. Um, DTI imaging can be performed, and we've done this as a research study, and we've characterized the um, uh, fetal intracranial um, uh, brain connections with tractography to um, you know, assess the structural changes during development as well. So in conclusion, it's a useful adjunct to ultrasound. Very helpful for CNS and chest uh, abnormalities. Uh, can be a problem solver uh, in abdominal pelvic lesions and very helpful in surgical planning as well. It also increases the diagnostic confidence. And as I said, the pediatric specialists have experience in reading MR examinations, but they have limited ability to interpret sonograms. So it's very helpful for them to counsel the patient as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, taking over next, we have uh, Matusha, ma'am. She will be taking the quiz. And uh, so the format is that there are 10 questions. Uh, the first eight questions are, of course, just for fun. The last two questions, the winners of the last two questions, the first two people to get the, the first uh, person to get the answer right in each uh, question will get a free registration. Alternately, you can use the registration link that I have posted in the uh, chat box along with the program. And uh, uh, we also have paper and poster submissions. The deadline is the 22nd of October, which is the next Sunday. Uh, ma'am, if we can start the quiz. Yeah, Abhishek. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. I'll just start the presentation. Yeah. So as Abhishek explained, we are going to have this uh, short quiz. It will be 10 questions and you have to directly put your answers in the chat box. 
the last two will be the prize winning questions and the person who gives the correct answer first uh, they get uh, free registration to the complete uh, five day mri teaching course online edition which we have been talking about uh, so uh, i think we can start with the first question on your screen uh, yeah abhishek you can project it so this is uh, around the 11 year old kid who came with frequent episodes of vomiting and this is the mri so what do you think it is just put your answer in the chat box yeah so i can see people coming up with uh, medulloblastoma ependymoma atrt So we can have the answers, uh, Bishik, uh, in the next slide. So this is a case of medulloblastoma. Uh, the appearance was little different from what we usually expect, but a midline tumor in pediatric age group and histopath also came out to be medulloblastoma itself. Uh, let's move to the next question. So here I have put in four options also to help you out because uh, it's not like a spotter. Per se, a 39-year-old who is immunocompetent came with this swelling, which was uh, kind of subacute and slowly increasing in size such that that area became almost like soft in consistency and it was like a defect in his skull. So you can see there are a set of MR images and one CT image also which we have provided. So what do you think? Because there are options that it is easy for you. It's quite hypo-intense on T2-weighted image. And I think most of you are getting it correct. It is aspergilloma and not osteosarcoma or not lymphoma. Uh, you can see that it has almost eroded completely the calvarium in that area. It is very dark on T2. And even on the gradient or swan images, we are getting these focal hypo-intensities which is often a marker of fungal uh, infestations because of the manganese and other heavy metal kind of uh, fungal uh, deposits there. So this is aspergilloma. And we were also seeing this kind of an aspergilloma for the first time in this patient. Uh, next question. So this is something which you people, I know uh, the diagnosis must be very easy for all of you. So I can, if we can, I, we can have the diagnosis uh, in the chat box first, and then I will ask the main quiz question. So what do you think it is? It's like an exam spotter, very common exam spotter when we are preparing for our practicals. So correct, this is HOD, which is hypertrophic olivary degeneration. Now your question for the quiz is, which is the tract which is involved in this phenomena? So all of you have identified the correct phenomenon, which is hypertrophic olivary degeneration. What do you think is the tract involved here? Yes, so Dr. Shubham has given the correct answer as dentato rubro olivary pathway. So we can have the next screen, Abhishek. So that is the pathway which is involved in this hypertrophic olivary degeneration, dentato rubro olivary pathway. So in this pathway, if there is any insult, most commonly it is a vascular insult, then we see this phenomena. Uh, now this is your next question. You have to give the diagnosis for this case. In a 60-year-old with upper abdominal pain and no history of pancreatitis, what do you think this cystic lesion in the pancreas is? One answer which we have received is cholidocal cyst. Do you think it is a cholidocal cyst? Do you think it is coming from the CBD or is it coming from other duct?
ex, uh, extra hepatic cholecystic cyst the hint is that it is not communicating with the cholecystic cyst maybe the images uh, are not 3d here but it is communicating with the pancreatic duct then what do you think it is So I think we have got the correct answer. It is IPMN. So this is uh, IPMN from one of the side branches. So now let's go to the next question. So there are two sets to uh, subset to this particular image. One is that what is the abnormality in the right breast and then in the left breast. So you can just in short mention right and the diagnosis left breast and the diagnosis. And if you have confusion regarding right left, you can see the heart. So cardiac apex is towards the left breast. In that case, also the smaller one here is the left breast and the larger one is the right breast. So what is the abnormality in the right and what is the abnormality in the left breast? So right radial fold and left rupture of implant by Dr. Shubham. And that is the correct answer. So if you see... Uh, on the right side, we are seeing something which is uh, usually expected and it's a bin not like an insidious finding. It is usually seen on a long-standing implant. It's just a radial fold. Whereas the left side, what we are seeing is an actual implant rupture. Yeah, so we can have the next slide. So we, there are two kinds of rupture and after implant uh, of uh, implantation of silicone or saline breast uh, implants, we usually get a fibrous scar formation around the implant shell. And thereby, implants can have intracapsular or extracapsular ruptures. And we have different, different uh, appearances and pathognomonic features of these kind of ruptures. Uh, now, what is the next question? So now it's question number six. And just to remind you, last two means question number nine and 10 will be the prize winning ones. Uh, what do you think this one is a liver lesion t1 and then post contrast uh, we have given directly in a young patient 27 year old yes so correctly mentioned this is fnh and i think all of you dr uh, shelindra dr shubham deepak vyas all of you are getting it correct it is fnh only so a central scar, which is taking up contrast in the late phases. But yes, we should have put in T2 weighted images as well because that typically have a T2 hyper intense scar uh, in contrast to fibrolamular carcinomas, etc. where the scar is not T2 hyper intense. Uh, next question. Question number seven. Uh, what is this lesion in the spinal cord? We have images of Sagittal T2, axial T2, and sagittal T1 post contrast. Yeah, so what do you think it is? So astrocytoma is something uh, which we are getting as answers, intramedullary astro. But if you see, it's like more like a, la a larger cystic lesion with a small enhancing component eccentrically placed. So we can have the next slide, answer slide. It is hemangioblastoma with a typical appearance of a cyst with a solid enhancing nodule. Yeah, so next slide. So question number eight is very easy. And then we move to the prize winning question. Uh, so I think I should quickly get the answers to this. It's a typical appearance of uh, something, the diagnosis to it, which is an emergency situation. So what is this? A typical MRI appearance of, as correctly mentioned by Dr. Shubham Shailendra and Molly Kora, as ovarian torsion. So this is how we see torsion on MRI. It's a large ovary, scattered follicles in the periphery. The central stoma becomes very hyper intense and then other features. So twisted pedicle, 
whirlpool sign kind of an appearance of the twisted pedicle we can have free fluid and patient will give history of acute abdominal pain now be quick in answering because the ninth question is going to be on your screen and the correct answer will get you prize so here it is question number 9 so what do you think it is you have to give a complete diagnosis uh it's an easy one just identify and give a short but complete diagnosis so yes we have we are uh, like getting answers in the chat box so what do you think it's sir we won't consider spelling mistake because i understand you are making it fast so uh i think we can give it to dr lakshmi narayan because it is a transphenic fistula dr molik also answered it correctly but lakshmi narayan had mentioned left sided uh, fistula transphenic so abhishek we can uh, consider uh, dr lakshmi narayan okay ma'am yeah and Can keep dr molikura also yeah let it be a tie no problems so okay. we take both dr molikura and dr lakshmi narayan yeah please uh, we request both of you to share your email ids and if possible phone numbers on the chat box uh, dr molikura and dr lakshmi narayan and you have been considered for free registration to the upcoming 5 days mri teaching course online edition and we hope you you definitely take advantage of the same uh, now the last question on your screen so be quick abhishek we can uh, display the last question yeah next uh, slide is the question here it is on your screen set of images in multiple planes all of them are t2 weighted images and they make one diagnosis together now what is that we are seeing the answers and uh, as uh, correctly mentioned by dr shubham ovira so that is uh, the thing here which we are depicting so we can have the next slide abhishek yeah so here uh, the winner to this is uh, this question will be dr shubham and please share your mail id and phone number on the chat box dr shubham and we'll register you for the upcoming course and this is a kind of a syndromic situation where we get duplication of uterus cervix and vagina so uterine didelphis and in this scenario it is right sided the hematocolpus but it can be any side and ipsilateral renal agenesis is there so obstructed hemi vagina that is why that ballooning in, is there ipsilateral renal anomaly is seen so that is ovira or also known as herlin werner wandelich syndrome so thank you all for joining us today for the prelude congratulations to the winners please share your uh, details in the chat box and on sunday again we'll have a prelude session there'll be three lectures back to back uh, that is going to start at 10 am so please do join uh, for the same we have again dr alok jaju then we have dr raj kedar for mri and renal masses and we'll have dr ashish chavla talking about mri in cholangiocarcinomas this will be followed by a short quiz so participate in that as well and with this i think abhishek you can end uh, today's prelude session okay ma'am i'll just share the program